Welcome to A Cinematic Journey, the show where we explore the themes, scenes, and elements of the movies that we love. I'm your host, Peter Billingsley, alongside talented filmmaker, stand-up comedian, Mr. Steve Byrne. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for that kind introduction, and happy holidays to you. Yeah, happy holidays to you, too. This is a really fun one. And today's film has an appearance from a former president's brother. The cast has five Oscar nominees, with three of them winning. The director got his start directing music videos for both Tupac and Coolio. Uh, The idea for the story was inspired by the producer's child. And it is the third collaboration between the movie's director and its star. Pete, we must be talking about... Fred Claus. Uh, Ow! You can't take my television. I watched that in bed. Are you nuts? You can't just come running up and kick someone like that. How old are you? Nine. Nine? And you have a 55-inch plasma TV in your room? Santa got it for me for Christmas last year. Yeah, well, the big guy in the red suit's not looking out for your future, is he? You're going to get hooked on that thing. I can see it now. 16,000 bags of Cheetos later, you wake up, you're 35, you're overweight, you're crying about your life in front of the soaps. I just did you a favor. You get outside, you play around, you make some friends, play kick the can, do some athletic stuff, you go to school, you're comfortable to play sports, you get a partial scholarship. Do you have any ethnic in your background, any authenticity at all in your background? I bet you do. It's America. Do you know what I mean? Find out what it is and put that down on the application for college. Well, in a fairy tale setting, many mythical years ago, we meet Fred. Fred literally is seeing his younger brother, Nicholas, being born, and he declares to Nicholas, I will be the best big brother to you in the world. Mm. And as they grow up, Nicholas, uh, he's very nice. In fact, he's almost seemingly perfect. This starts eating away at Fred, and Fred uh, eventually makes a turn for the worse. He becomes a little naughty. Now, as they get older, Nicholas is sainted. He's become Saint Nicholas, or as children know him, Santa Claus. Yes, this is the origin of Santa Claus. And we flash forward many years later and we catch up with Fred in modern times. It is now Christmas time in Chicago. He is a repo man. So (laughs) while Santa gives gifts, Fred taketh away gifts from people. (laughs) Fred does have a girlfriend. He's forgotten her birthday again. And he never fulfilled his promise to take her to France. At this point, she's really at her wit's end. Well, we also see that Fred lives alone in a very small apartment, but he's befriended a neighbor kid next door named Slam, who seems to be heading down the wrong path. Now, while Fred is charming, he's fast talking, he's very funny, he doesn't seem to be taking responsibility for his actions. He's falling short of expectations. But Fred does have a dream. He has a dream and a plan and a way out of his misfortune. He intends to open and operate an off-track betting facility (laughs) right across from the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. The only problem is he needs $50,000 to put down as a deposit, and he needs it by December 22nd. Fred is broke. Yes. So he makes a quick turn, decides, I know how I'll raise some money. I'll start a charity called People Helping People. Fred has no permit, and Fred is ultimately arrested and thrown in jail. We also catch up with Santa Claus present day. He's extremely stressed out. With Christmas right around the corner, they're running 2% behind, and they barely, barely made Christmas last year. That's right. So with Fred in jail needing $5,000 bail on top of his 50 k <laughs> he is forced to make the phone call that he really doesn't want to make to the one person he really doesn't want to face, and that is his younger brother, Santa Claus. Yes. And that leads us to the central conflict of this film. <clears throat> hey, Fred. Hey. So, five grand. Michigan Avenue Police Station. Done. Merry Christmas, Fred. Nick, that is, I really appreciate it, man. You know what? I'm going to give you something. I'm going to give you a gift this year. Oh. Yeah, I am. I'm going to give you $10,000 for Christmas in cash. Merry Christmas. Okay? How's that yeah. deal? <laughs> That's... Uh, I don't understand, though. I th- I'm giving you five, Fred, so... Nick, listen, you got to be open to someone else trying to give to you because it feels good for other people to give, too, okay? Yeah. Go ahead, just send me $50,000 on top of the five, okay? Then hold your breath for a month. Let me go ahead and blow that up into 60, okay? Then I'm going to give you $10,000 off the top of that with the original $50,000 back. So that way I gave you $10,000. You gave me $5,000. I gave you $5,000. Merry Christmas. Wait, 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 wait a second, Fred. $50,000 on top of the five? $50,000, that's just icing on top of the cake. I have a very lucrative money deal going on. Nick, do me a favor. Don't make this complicated. Uh, let me give, I'm in the spirit. Let me give you a gift. Let one brother give another brother a gift. For Christmas, I feel great about it. Let me feel good. All right, whoa, 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 whoa. Please let me All right, this. all right, all right, all right. Fred, fine. Look, I'll tell you what. I will pay the 5000 for your bail, okay? Uh-huh. But if you want the rest of this, then I mean, you're just going to have to come up here. No! Yes, you earn that money. Okay, let's be honest. Nick, I don't think that's a good idea for me and you to be working with you each other. You know something? You know what I'm saying? You've never come up here to visit. 
Not even once. What is it exactly? What, I, what would I need to be doing up there? Uh, shave a few reindeer, sprinkle the doodads on the cookies, put the stars up where the little guys can't reach them. It's easy stuff. I'd have to have a hard out by the 22nd. Okay. That's why I have my lucrative deal happening. Okay. 22nd. This is about me coming up there and then you having mom ambush me oh, and having a... I'm, I'm serious. serious. Come on, I'm not going to go running to mom. I have no idea why you won't send me 50 so I can blow it up into 60 and I can give you 10. Uh, that way you I'm sorry. Buy. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to practice tough love on you, buddy. All right? And, and I'm telling you right now, if you do not agree, then I am sorry, but I cannot pay your bail. Oh, such a good scene. <laughs> There's so much to it. The idea that Santa even has a brother. Right. <laughs> you hear about the mom. Clearly, there's issues there with Fred as well. Right, right. <laughs> uh, you can see Santa's wife, Mrs. Claus, doesn't want her her brother-in-law around. So it's it's just this kind of complicated messiness, which is great. It's really the central question that this movie asks: is right. Can these two estranged brothers repair their relationship, and can Santa pull off Christmas this year? Now with Fred coming up to the North Pole, <laughs> so <laughs> so the game is set. And this is further complicated by an efficiency expert who comes up to the North Pole and is really intent on shutting them down if they have three strikes against them. Right. Three mistakes or mishaps. This guy's also, resp- he says he's shutting down the Easter Bunny. <laughs> right. So with Christmas in jeopardy, under the watchful eye of an efficiency expert, <laughs> the last person you would probably want to come help yes. is Fred Claus, but he's coming up to the North Pole because his big brother Santa wants him there. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. No matter how many gifts you get this holiday season, you get to define how you give to yourself. For those who have participated in or have given the gift of therapy, you know it helps people become the best versions of themselves. In the season of giving, give yourself what you need with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Christmas today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Christmas. Naughty, not nice. So we are excited to have producer and director of Fred Claus, David Dobkin. Hey, how <laughs> thank are you? you so Good much for being here, man. Yeah, thank you. This is great. This fun. is really, really fun and a really fun one to rewatch uh, and to dive in. And would love to start at the beginning. Um, yeah. When and how were you first exposed to the script of this movie? The script came to me through Warner Brothers um, and Jeff Robinov at the time, who was. Um, head of production there and was my first agent. Yeah. So I got the script and I read it and I really fell in love with the warmth of it, with the characters in it, and the idea was hilarious. But there was a premise that Dan Fogelman, that, who wrote the script, had in the material that was really what grabbed me immediately, which was this idea, this kind of revisionist idea of like, wait a minute. There are no naughty kids, if you Mm -hmm. take a moment and think about it, right? Right. I mean, the idea of naughty and nice is a very old idea, and we know so much more about ourselves and how people are now, and we know why people may misbehave. Right. Right. So this idea that Fred is caught in a misunderstanding, and he is being looked at and labeled as a naughty kid when he's a kid who ha- needs some more attention and doesn't understand right. what's happening in his family and is having trouble growing and fitting into the world. When that line was in the script, which he says, there are no naughty kids, to yeah. Santa, and Santa having that reckoning was so dope. Mm-hmm. I was like, wow, that's a modern Christmas. I just was really well, yeah. taken by it. I thought that was brilliant. Mm-hmm. It's a huge idea that I don't think we've really seen explored Never. so much in a Christmas film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But by the way, for me, when also this idea that for Christmas, kids, for anyone watching a Christmas movie, that we've all been naughty kids. We've all done things wrong. Sure. So for all of a sudden, everyone who's watching that movie who relates to that has their story being told as opposed right. to just well, trying to 100%. be a good kid, you know? So that was really cool. I was like, oh, it's a Christmas movie for actually the naughty kids too. What are we rating for? I think something a lot of people don't know about this movie is that it was initially conceived as a PG-13 movie. Yeah, when I 
when I got attached, when Vince got attached, it was a PG-13 movie. So you guys got attached mm-hmm. at basically the same time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think for me, the movie was to do it with Vince. Was, right. Was the reason to do the movie. And this was, was your this... third collaboration. You'd done Clay Pigeons. You'd done yeah. Wedding Crashers. Yeah. And this was your third yeah, time yeah, coming exactly. together. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, we've always had a, a very fast and close friendship and connection creatively it just was one of those roles i was like he's gonna kill it he's gonna be so it's gonna be so so fun now it was an interesting thing there was a moment when the movie became more expensive and more expensive sometimes you get stuck into a hollywood run somebody you know at the studio at one point said well i don't know why this is costing so much money like we wanted to make a movie like elf and i Said to them, like, yeah, but that's like a guy who's like in the North Pole for 10 minutes and then he comes and he's in, in a costume in New York City. Right. This is a dude that goes to the North Pole <laughs> and we're there the whole right. time. Like, right. I can't make it like the first 10 minutes. You will, right. You will get a for the will, entire movie. For the entire right, movie. Nobody will want to spend that much that time, time there. In the North Pole. And it's it, it because the concept is flipped, it got complicated. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Um, it required visual effects and it required all these other things to tell the story. Um, and that is part of the story of Hollywood. You have juice coming off of wedding crashers, and nobody's going to um, you have an incredible amount of freedom. Right. right, and you can hang yourself with it too a little bit. So the movie became more expensive than we wanted it to be, and once that happened, when they looked at the history of how much Christmas movies made, they were like, "You have to be a PG movie, right? We, now you have we, to be four quadrant. We're crossing you have to be, this, right. this yeah. price point." And now, for me, who didn't have kids yet, you know, I'm an irreverent comedian. I'm sure. a comedian that's known for. Um, pushing boundaries and but making people comfortable like i've never been someone that's been you know when you think even when you think of wedding crashers yeah. it's it's fun it has sexiness but it's also easy it's that's it's, right. it's not pushing it doesn't buttons. cross lines right. i'm right. not it's not porkies it's right. not something right. sure. that's really ch- challenging that way because i love the warmth and the heart and sure so when i got in there we were like sure pg that's fine sure. and then i'd be writing jokes on set because things would be changing and the producer would be like, no, that's an innuendo, and that's that. And I was like, oh, my God, oh, I'm really not. There was a certain teeth to the character that was very hard to get to PG. And right. that was you're talking about like bad language. Santa is what right. they saw. They said, "Can you do a PG thirteen bad Santa?" And I was like, "Yeah, I can for sure." Right. A PG bad Santa? No. Very difficult. Right. Hard with and the I, DNA I of that could, story. I couldn't do it, and I, and I didn't learn till later. Once I had kids. I was like, oh, they think oh, that's what they find funny. You know right. what I mean? Like, it's a little bit broader. It's a little bit different. It's a little bit simpler. Starring lineup. I want to talk about the rest of the cast. We talked about sure. your collaborations with Vince, but the rest of the cast is really spectacular. Paul Giamatti is Santa. Rachel Weiss is Fred's girlfriend. Miranda Richardson is Mrs. Claus. Kevin Spacey, who I know has had recent challenges, but is terrific as Clyde the villain. And of course, Kathy Bates is Fred's mom. Big personalities, though, obviously, Fun. and great resumes, good collaboration. Yeah. Do I remember this correctly? You came down after breakup. We were in Mexico. We all took a little trip, and you came down for a couple days to hang. Were you reading Phil Jackson's Eleven Rings book? I was. And that deals and with, always, and Victoria reminded me of this. And part of that is working with and succeeding with yeah. big personalities. She I, reminded me just you were doing your research. It's by always reading, been Phil Jackson. Right. You, you nailed it. I, I don't think it was 11 <laughs> Rings yet. I think it was um, the last season as well. Okay. I, but I've read them all. When he came to L.A., and I had watched Kobe and Shaq just get swept every year. Right. I was like, oh, this is going to be fascinating. I want to see how this guy deals with Because he, the way he had dealt with Dennis Rodman, right. I was aware of. And yep. I was like, this guy's a genius. And it was about how you coach and engage and get them invested and getting them to work together, together. as right. a team. This is a murderer's row. There's uh, like five yeah. Oscar nominees, three winners. <laughs> this is not your typical Christmas movie cast. No. Nor Christmas nor comedy. comedy. Yeah. yeah. Right. How did you approach working with with this group? Well, they're, look, Vince Vaughn is not only one of the best comedians of his generation, he's one of the best actors. And so my desire as a fan of his, and I start always as a fan, 
I don't know how you put a movie together except just being like, oh my God, I would love to see that person play this role and play right. this role. I want to see the chemistry of these people. And this desire to see Giamatti and Vince together yeah. was like kind of eating me alive. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, Giamatti was, it really started with Paul. Mm -hmm. And I just loved this idea of this guy that was emotionally overwhelmed by his role. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like just so... You know, you're eating too much. Yeah. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. again, like that funny thing about looking at the humanity, what would the real story of this be if we got to see it? Right. Um, and then once we had Paul and we knew what that combo was, everybody else started to jump on board. Absolutely. You know, and, well, and a, it was yeah. wonderful. You know, Kathy Bates is his mom and just seeing those three. Right. So mm -hmm. it became a dream cast. So this was like, like a lot of your first choices just with love were. him. And I boom. wanted Spacey because he had so little screen time and he needed to carry this weird otherworldly threat, right. mm -hmm. but also have the sensitivity at the end. Mm -hmm. And right. he's an incredible actor. Sure. You know, he's an amazing actor. Miranda Richardson, I've always been a fan of. I, sure. You know, um, Rachel Weiss was a dream. They were all amazing. Video helped the movie star. I want to talk a little bit about your music video background. We play some videos here. You directed some great music videos, directed for Tupac, for Coolio, Maroon 5, others. Yeah. Can we just look at a piece of this Tupac video sure. here? So will the real men get up? I know you're fed up, ladies. But keep your head up. Now, you shot that on Rodeo Drive, is that correct? <laughs> yeah, clearly. No. no. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I want to bring that up because it's a device that you also use in film. Yeah. And you think about the great montage in yeah. Crashers that yeah. is just so big and so satisfying. Thank you. You do one here as well, and I just want to take a yeah. peek at this scene as well. It's a big, fun, satisfying scene, but yeah. it's a unique skill you have as a filmmaker because it's sort of a tool you have in your toolbox. Yeah. You know, whether they came from those roots, it's something that you've developed. Can you talk about how you use sort of music videos in film as part of the storytelling? Music naturally already has movement to it, so it's great. As soon as the camera starts to move mm -hmm. and you have music going, already something's happening, which is why when you listen to music in your car, you're all of a sudden in a movie all the right. time. Right, right. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's true. just like as soon as it's moving. But I love it. You have rhythm and ideas and things going. You know, Vince picked that song, I remember. I've always loved him and Elvis. He loves Elvis. Completely. So yes. there's something really funny and synergistic He's an actually good it. dancer, too. You can He's tell an he amazing has rhythm. Dancer. He's yes. yeah. putting the restraints on here. Oh, yeah. But you can just tell he has natural rhythm. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. He loves it. He's cool. Yeah. He's sexy. Totally, exactly. And, and so... Music videos are very, were very interesting. You were only as good as the song that you had. You know, right. if you had a great song, you were in, you know, you have a song from Tupac, you were in a great position. There were right. plenty of songs that I had that were not, were okay, but were not great. But then the videos could have been great, but you're limited. Right. Now in a movie, what I think is so great is you have all of the storytelling devices working for you and you have a chance to advance the story in some sort of way and emotionally take people somewhere. Right. Um, when you hit a montage, you're doing something different. You know, it's, 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 it's a real, it's a set piece of sorts. It's a For way, sure. it's a way that it's one of the big entertainment ideas. It's always been there, you know, even in musicals, people will always love music and dance. I do, I do. Sure, you know? sure. Like, well, you're good at it and it works really well in the movies and it's really satisfying. It's, and it's very just, satisfying. It's a nice skill that you have. Cause you see people try it sometimes and it falls flat. In it's movies, really and short, it's sort of, it, it's, yeah, <laughs> then like, they get that room, the editor's like, hey, maybe uh, three, four shots. Yeah, 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 yeah. A little goes a I think long you way. Missed. That's <laughs> right. what you hear when it's not working. Yeah. <laughs> a little goes a long <laughs> yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so true when it's not working. It's funny, because I was just thinking that was a compliment. I was like, oh, thanks. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Yeah, we really yeah, nailed yeah. it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like, working, no. so now we can get rid of right. it. Oh, yeah. excellent. Okay, good. Masterclass. I'd love to um, talk about the Santa fight scene early. And oh my. <laughs> uh, he's raising money for his OTB. You know, the Salvation Army guys are getting upset that he's on their <laughs> turf. And this is going to be a chase. Now, I he, forgot this. But wait, that's 
the physical comedy piece that I love in the movie mm -hmm. that when I was in the theater testing and I could see the kids go nuts right. was that set was piece. This one. Well, let's take a look at this scene. Okay. <laughs> One man's gonna walk away from this thing, and I promise you, it's gonna be the lightning quick dude with the big yellow things in his hand. Dig it? So that was uh, choreographed by Dion Lamb from Matrix, yeah. Spider-Man. There's no wire work here. It's pretty stripped down. It's all straightforward, yeah. but he's awesome. He, has, he also has... I I got to the I had the pleasure of making a Jackie Chan movie, so I got to oh, learn okay. the process mm -hmm. from him. And I was so funny because I went in on that movie with like all my storyboards. I had worked really hard on the action scenes. I went to go meet him in his trailer on another movie. And he looked, he goes, "Oh, this is very nice," and he threw it in the trash can. <laughs> <laughs> He goes, I do the action and you tell the story and make it funny. And, and I was like, I was like, I really kind of really love the action too. He goes, oh, you want to learn? And I said, yeah. So I came back the next week and met with him and I said, Jackie, look, your movies, I'm a huge fan for a long time. I know all your real stuff, the yeah. police story and all that oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. Before everybody kind of had, he had already broken here because of rush hour, but I knew all the early stuff. And. I was like, I just really want to know why in your American movies your stuff is not as cool as your Chinese films. And I realized, of course, as soon as that comes out of my mouth, I'm like, oh, Oops. man, now I'm going to get replaced. And he looked at me and goes, I have no time. I don't, you guys, I spend, you know, tons of time, weeks on these scenes, and mm -hmm. you guys give me two, three days. So I went back to production. Interesting. And I came up with this idea i said well if i can slip the second unit we start the action scenes on a monday mm -hmm. and we shoot for two days with first unit and then the second unit comes in we leave that set and they pick it up so they've been lit and set up by the first right. unit mm -hmm. they come in direct wednesday thursday friday then i will come because it's a set offset week i will come direct saturday and sunday second unit with jackie right so he will be on the second unit mm -hmm for an extra two to four days on every scene. So I huge. went to him. That's just a huge wow. amount of time. Yes. It turned into six Massive days, eight days right. a scene instead of two to three, four. And I went to him. I said, look, this is totally illegal. We're shooting in Prague. No one's going to catch us. I said, but I'm willing to work seven days a week if you are. Right. And he was like, yes. And he was in. I did 90 days straight. I was down for one day. I got so sick. And then, uh, and he did, I think, the whole movie. And... But it was amazing because when he came in, so that kind of choreography. Sort of your it, film school of action, if you will, you're learning. you learning because it's yes. jazz. You, right. You're making this stuff up as you go and changing the angles and following the ideas. Now, this we tried to choreograph, but Dion thinks like that. Like, mm -hmm. what is in the environment to use? They don't go looking for, like, the yellow right. things were his idea. He's like, I saw these things. Mm -hmm. and Just grab them. And, yeah. and and they were fun. They're just really funny. But that's like, and to then, your point, like, with Police Story. I mean, yeah. they're using practical, everyday things oh you God. see in the mall and yeah. maximizing every ounce of anything you can and see And the, the architecture, mall. everything that he right. can do. And by the way, when I'm making the movie with the, the Jackie Chan movie, Shanghai mm -hmm. Nights, He'd walk in and try to use whatever was there, and you'd be like, wait, wait, we have to rig that. You can't just grab that chandelier and swing over there to that ladder. And like, it was, We had a 24-hour right. prop shop that, based on what he touched, we would build the, the jars or the... It was a crazy thing because it is jazz. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're, it, it's also fun because you're on a huge scale and you're trying to make these decisions in the moment. And... There's For me, I felt like there it, should have been a bigger ending because I was like, oh, it. he's right. just he's going to pick up these yellow don't wet floor signs? That's right. our ending? Mm -hmm. But it was so funny that once he did it and showed me, I was like, oh, I get it. It's right. really fun. <laughs> and then once you have Vince saying, you know, the guy with the 
big yellow things in his hands. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, it's, just, <laughs> it's just so good. On the mark. I'd like to talk a little bit about Mark Lavolsi, who's an editor who you worked with uh, three times that I know of on Wedding yeah. Crashers, Fred Claus, and then on The Judge later. Yeah. Uh, some of the directors he worked with, Cameron Crowe, yourself, John Favreau, John Lee Hancock, he was sought after by a lot of really quality filmmakers. Yeah. And I think Mark's work has a signature to it. It has, in, in many ways, such a feel-good nature to so much of what he does and so many of the movies that he makes. What, what, what was he able to bring to this movie? Mark was so talented. By the way, maybe the best batting average of an editor I've ever seen. Unbelievable, Blindside, right? Jungle Book, Lion King, Devil Wears Prada, Wonder... Yep. Marley and Me. I mean, these yeah. are nobody has as many hits. No, I know. And there's no <laughs> wedding in crashers, in saving Mr. Banks. Yeah. Like I know, it's crazy. One of his gifts, and by the way, most of those filmmakers called me when they were about to interview him. And every single one of them, I was, I said the same thing, which was, Mark' sense of first of all of the material. He will build out of the best stuff. He finds the best stuff. Mm -hmm. There's nothing will shake your sensibility worse than when you start editing with somebody new and you realize that you have a different sensibility of which shots were mm -hmm. the good takes and which ones right. weren't. His comedy rhythms are incredible. He has an attack with comedy. He's an aggressive comedy editor. What does that mean? He doesn't wait for the lines to be funny. He cuts them so that they mm -hmm. work funny. Mm -hmm. It's different. Sometimes your actors are being funny and you just let it open and you right. go to some reaction shots and it runs. Mark knew how to change the rhythms and tighten and loosen and do things. And it was it was really amazing. And I had, I hired him because I went to go see a movie that he had done with Luke Greenfield. I can't remember the name of the movie, but I went in the theater and I was like, and it was I liked the movie. But I could tell the comedy editing was really smart. He was getting big laughs out mm -hmm. of things that were kind of funny. Right. Because he would upcut the delivery on the punchline and stuff. Mm -hmm. It was very interesting. And I was like, oh, this guy's very smart. Then the emotional work. Yeah, that's... I, you know, right? I was on Wedding Crashers when he sent me the scene. I had pitched him how to cut together the tiptoeing down the hallway to each other between Owen and um, Rachel. Yeah. And when he sent me the cut, of, I've never changed a frame in that entire really? sequence. Yeah. It's tough. Sadly, Mark passed away, but his I know. contributions to... Your work oh my to the God. film industry, mm -hmm. Amazing. you know, his resume, and it's the nice thing about film, it's going to live on forever, but it it's, is. It's, it's very yeah. cool to hear your thoughts on Mark. Yeah, just, he was I special. never had the chance to work with him, but as a fan of his movies, um, just love what he was able to do. Off with their heads. The movie has heart and comedy, but it delivers... Yeah on the effects. The sledding sequences are tremendous. And yeah, they're really fun. You get to decide how you, what you want to do with the elves. And you made a choice to hire John Michael Higgins to play the head elf. Yeah. Can you talk about just the technical process? You know, you didn't just choose somebody who was naturally shorter in that role. Yeah. Or do forced perspective. You have a lot of options, I guess, if you will, and, and just how you landed on that. Because they're in the movie all the time. I, I needed it to be real, and I also could have, like, one person. And the DJ. Ludacris plays the DJ. Ludacris mm -hmm. plays it, right. And, of course, um, Higgins plays Willie the head out. Yeah, and what happened is the visual effects... I had um, Nick Davis take a look at it, who's a buddy of mine who's a visual effects wizard, and he was like, I would try to do this. There's an in-camera technique. This sounds crazy, but... Mm -hmm. There's a guy that I know that's one of my assistants who just did a movie with the Wayans brothers. And he goes, the little person does the body stuff, and then you redo it again with the head, and you literally just put the head on. And I was like, that's crazy. Like, I, that, that sounded like a nightmare. Mm -hmm. Right. But once he walked me through it, it was the only process that was going to financially make sense, and it was going to work. Here we are. Oh, uh, watch your head there. Come on in. Here it is. What do you think? Smurfy. Very Smurfy. To be honest, I don't get many house guests. <laughs> I don't think anyone slept in that top bunk for a hundred years. Good night, Willie. Thank you for having me. Good night, Fred. You sure you want to be more comfortable down here on the bottom? I don't think it's going to make much of a difference, Willie.
And you wanted Higgins. He, he had done Break Up with Vince. Yeah, he's I so love, good. They I have a great Higgins. natural chemistry. Mm-hmm. They have great chemistry and together. He's, and he's a technician. Yes. He's like having a dancer or something, mm-hmm. you know. And he did a great job. And it was hard, you know, when the dancing and the spinning, like, he was on set to shoot everything with the original bot person playing his body. Mm-hmm. And then he had to come back six months later and we had to do everything again and put his head together. So you have and a body double, it. basically, who's, who's the... The, the yeah. correct size that you wanted Willie to be on stage. That person is performing scenes and masters with Vince and so forth. And yes. then Higgins is there to say the lines off camera. Yes. Vince's eye line is to the body double. That's correct. Then so later, he has someone to interact right. with. And I shoot a plate. So I remove that them all. I have a background. Now, you know, they go out there with the silver thing and you no, have, you, you, you just the map whole, the whole damn crazy. thing no, and no. You, it's so yeah. easy now. Right. No, um, but this was back then. You had to tile. It was, it was just, it was like. Frame ah. by frame, go across. It was right. literally only like f- six years from being able to do it in Completely. a much easier way. Right. Um, then uh, you have to go back and now you're going to get Willie's performance. So that sort of on a green screen, is that how you do it? On a green screen and you're on a stage and I brought back people to be off camera for him. So Vince would come back yeah. as, as much as you could for him. And we'd do it and then they would go in and you'd have to, much like uh, any visual effects shot, pick the background, pick the head, you hope they match. Right. I mean, you're on set trying to rough mat them together, high, you know, high com mats sure. to try to see how they line up. And then... It sticks, and look, somewhere in there is the magic of it eventually gets there, and you're now in the scene again. Right. It was complicated, and it was difficult, but it ended up working out, and it ended up being um, something that was the right solution for the movie. Foley smokes. I noticed something tonal, something that you did a little throughout and post some of the sound effects. Right, yeah. so you're... And, I saw this as I watched the Coolio video that you did. And you did that like I, it's I the buried... juxtaposition of these kitty sounds versus right. something that is on its face not kitty at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Coolio. And then here you're doing it mixed in this hardcore action. Damn, Pete, you're good. That's crazy. <laughs> Is that I you... hide cartoon sounds in the background of the impact sounds and stuff. Mm-hmm. I, I I did it in Coolio, and I did it in Shanghai Nights. Yeah, and I did it in this movie. Um, I haven't done it in everything, but I, I I will do it when physical sequences. Right. But I have my I have Tim Chow is my um my sound engineer, and I always have him. He preps a layer of other weird stuff that you can push in. Mm-hmm. But like horns, it's just, <laughs> right. I'm telling right. you, but you place them back there <laughs> and it's really fun. But the Coolio video is one of the first places where I did it, where I wasn't getting a laugh. You know what it was? I throw a dummy at one point and it lands on the ground right. in the Coolio video mm-hmm. and I wasn't getting a laugh. And the minute I added a big body thud, like a comedy body thud. Then everybody was laughing. Well, it's because they might not know how to take it. So it can help inform this You is can comedic. laugh at this violence. Right. And, and it, yeah. it, it probably it's, helps yeah. with also finding that PG tone in it the sea a of a PG-13 DNA. Mm-hmm. That's absolutely right. You know, those are the sort of sprinkles that you're putting in along the way. Absolutely. That's a little trick I always had. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for all the insight and yeah, yeah, all the I stories that you shared the way with that you guys like. oh, This got, is amazing. We love to but get in. Our audience nerdy loves and to learn filmic, it. But it was great, it was and great. you got it's you're fun. so smart. Thank you very much. You got it. Guys. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, thanks. Awesome. Merry Christmas, Pete. It's the holidays. Yes. What do you think about? You think about food. You and I were were, were dudes. We love food. Oh yes, we love <laughs> cooking. We love cooking for and with our families. Yes. And we're going to be doing a lot of cooking on our Traeger this holiday season. Yes. In fact. We're going to fire it up, and we're going to do a turkey on the Traeger, and we're going to smoke a pie for dessert. Done. So many great products. They have rubs. They have sauces. At Traeger.com, you can get all of your cooking needs right right there in one stop. And I've been using the Wi-Fi connectivity, which means that I can monitor the temperature, the duration of the cook right on the Traeger app on my phone. Right. I don't even have to be at home. So for something like the size of a turkey, I get it on, I get the probes in it, and I just start to watch this thing as it cooks. I don't have to keep opening the lid, right, doing the right. push test, 
second guessing, hoping mm -hmm. that it's done. I know exactly to the number what the internal temperature is, and I basically just wait until it's done. They have the pellets. They have different flavored pellets. That's right. They have right. different sauces and rubs and everything. It, it, it's all encompassing. So whether you're just starting out or you're a seasoned veteran, Traeger has the right grill for you. These grills are available in all different types at Traeger.com, mm -hmm. and they have a sale going on right now. They don't do a lot of sales. It's $300 off select grills. Go to Traeger.com, check it out. The Legend of Fred Claus. We're excited to have in studio co-producer and star of Fred Claus and producer of our show, Mr. Vince Vaughn. Thank you very much, Vince. Nice for to be with you. How here. are you, Stephen Byrne? <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> it's great to see you. <laughs> uh, I would love to talk a little bit about your character, Fred. Fred's sort of a darker and I think more flawed character than you might see in a lot of more traditional Christmas movies. Can you mm. talk a little bit about how you approached building your character, Fred, for this? You know, it's 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 normal in these Christmas movies sometimes that you would start with someone not really loving the idea of Christmas mm -hmm. or against it. You know, if you look at like the Dickens stuff or or Scrooge, right? Sure. It's it's usually you can start someone at a place and then they go on a journey and change. Right. So I think for Fred, um, you know, he you have a sibling rivalry, which is kind of fun. The, the the golden boy versus the kid that could never do anything right. right. And then on top of it, you have like, if your brother's Christmas <laughs> and you have an issue with him, <laughs> right. then like anything yes. Christmas is a reminder of like the parents, right. you know, kind of thinking oh, yeah. everything he does is okay. I think one of the things when you play characters, and I, and I hear this a lot, people say, well, gosh, you wouldn't think that character is likable. You know, a lot of times those characters are, sometimes the most beloved because we can relate to them. Right. A, a character is action. What you do in life is who you are. What right. you say is one thing, mm -hmm. but what the character does or how they interact or how they treat people is how the audience will see him for who right. his true essence is. Right. And so there's some smart things early on, I think, with Fred where you could see that there's a person there that has some compassion in him some awareness, you know, his interactions with some of the people in his life, the young boy. Yeah, right. slam. Yep. Right. You can you can see that despite his want to sort of close off, that his nature is to participate with people. Right. And also Jesse Nelson, who's awesome. She was the producer. I think it was her original idea. Did you guys talk about Jesse? Yeah. Well, the origin story for Jesse was that she was reading a Christmas story to her child. And right. afterwards, her, her kid said, does, does Santa have a brother? She thought about it and kind of didn't know the answer, but I think her big light bulb was, <laughs> that's a good premise for a movie. Yeah. And that's a really good idea. And Fred being the name. Yeah, that's yeah. right, and Fred being the name, and mm -hmm. took the time to write the story. That went into Warner Brothers, and then Warner Brothers hired Dan Fogelman to do the original right. first draft. And the idea of if you grew up in the shadow of Santa, what would that be like? And, right. and what would right. that ultimately do to you? But yeah, that's really the thing with those kinds of characters is, you got to have a character that is rough around the edges and has somewhere to go. Mm -hmm. You know, no people are perfect. And so in this case, you know, you have issues. But you, you have to give enough with those characters for the audience to kind of root for them. You know, it's right. one thing to have a character that by the end you say, okay, they got it, and I kind of forgive them. Right. But that's different than if you're hoping a character can evolve right. because you kind of are rooting for them and you like right. them. Mm -hmm. Phoning it in. The chemistry with you and Giamatti is really good. There's a scene that we looked at that, that really kind of starts the journey of this movie when Fred's in prison. I had heard that in production, they built the jail cell next to Santa's bedroom so that you guys could shoot at a similar time. And I know, having worked with you, that things like phone calls, Vince will really ask early in prep the prop department and others to be ahead and prepared on the day to say, let's have a live phone, let's mm -hmm. have both, let's have the actor available and on set, let's record both actors, not have a script supervisor reading off camera lines. Can you just maybe shed some light on why that's important to you and maybe how in a good way it really helps affect the scene in a positive way for the audiences to see? Well, as an actor, I think you're always trying to, to be in that reality as much as possible. So the more you can be focused on being in the moment and not distracted by other things, and the more you can immerse yourself in it, it obviously is easier to react 
right. and to kind of be in that place. You sort of get yourself in the right state and then obviously in your environment. Um, there's times, you know, where you're not going to be able to do that as well and you're going to have to rely on a deeper focus and a, the ability to kind of block, you know, to, to immerse yourself in the moment and block certain things out. So it just depends. But if you're allowed that luxury, if you can work from that place, it's always better. I mean, you know as actors that... If your focus on the day is props or things that you weren't ready for, you can you can get there, mm -hmm. but it's easier if you kind of get ahead of it. I always right. like to be more prepared so that the day's easy mm -hmm. and that we really know what we're flying with. Now, the nature of filmmaking is sometimes things pop up or an idea comes up. But, you know, every every department being organized and working as an orchestra in unison is always making the day, because every department has to perform their job and it's important and everyone needs the time and the space to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be on top of each other. So like if you're getting wired, you want to get wired and be there for them to do that. Right. You know, if you're blocking for camera, it's important that you're there so that they have right. their time to do that. And this was right. always sort of how it was always done. There was well-organized sets where everyone worked together. It, when you have a problem is everyone is sort of you know, trying to get done sure. what they're trying to do in a way where it's on top of each other. But yes, I always prefer for everybody's sake to, to kind of, you know, think ahead. What, what are the things that could be a, a challenge this day? What can we do that works for everybody that can help create the, the strongest reality? And that yeah. scene must be, there's such a pendulum swing because it starts off, I'm in tears laughing. It, it's so darn funny. And then it really ends with, you know, the weight of the entire film, you know, the, the inciting incident moving forward with you guys ending on some real sentiment there, propelling it forward. And you can see why, because I think you can even hear some of the overlaps and they're recording both sides yep. of the scene and it feels so real. I think you don't leave that scene and don't like both of them. Right, right. And don't want them to... Hopefully find a way back. Find yeah. some yeah. connection, yeah. Siblings Anonymous. There is a really unique and creative way to use the mentor archetype in this movie. Fred has gotten his money for the OTB. He's left the North Pole. He gets home. He sees a gift from his brother. You can tell he's struggling. And that leads him into a really interesting meeting of the mentor. Let's take a look. My name is uh, Fred Claus. Hi, hi, Fred. Hi. I'm, uh, uh, I'm Santa Claus's brother. And I got a lot of stuff going on. Is this uh, a joke to you? Uh, Steven, by the way. Nice to see you. Hey guys, what's up? I mean, because this isn't funny to all of us. Wait, wait, Steven, maybe to him, his brother is Santa Claus. I feel like my brother's Santa Claus. Yeah, but, but I feel like my brother's Santa Claus because my brother really is Santa Claus. All right, that's enough, all right? You and I got a problem. Oh, all right, right. Steven, <laughs> easy, easy, all right. Steven, easy. That's not Alec. Steven, I think I know where you're coming from. Because I used to be really, really angry with my brother. I didn't want to become first brother, especially for the rest of my life. I couldn't control that. I couldn't control being brother of the President of the United States. But I could control being Bill Clinton's brother. And I made the decision, even though I could have brought the house down, I made the decision that for the love of my brother, and for the love of my family name, that I was gonna do whatever it took because I loved my brother. And I was always gonna be there for my brother. And I have been. And you know what? You can be too. Such a good scene. But it's like a lot of ways you talk about comedy. The situation's absurd, but these guys are playing it very real. Yeah. And in particular, Roger's performance in the end is really good, yeah. really sincere, and very, very real. I was shocked by Roger Clinton, how good he was and how resonant his message was. Can you talk about just kind of being on set that day playing the scene with these guys? Yeah, I mean, it goes to such an absurdity <laughs> that it, and it also grounds the world because it's an oddity that you're Santa's brother. Right. And so they bring that perspective of how crazy that is, mm -hmm. you know, in the natural world to it. And it kind of helps solidify that reality. And then clearly it's even, you know, uh, I think it's Frank Stallone. Uh, Correct. Sly's yes. brother, mm -hmm. who was very nice. All those guys were great. But 
and they all had fun with it and, and, and dove into it and were super committed to it. And it brings such an oddity. Right. So there's an oddity going on, like on a couple of different levels, that this is a reality. Right. And it's really hitting home. Right. So in a way that you don't expect it, mm -hmm. the obvious would be, hey, you're mad at your brother, but that's right, still right, your right. brother. In a way that we don't get it, where it's funny, it's absurd, it's odd, it kind of surprisingly gives you the message that Fred needs to hear at that moment, which is, at the end of the day, this is right. your brother, this is your family, and you're not going to give in and allow that to be that's torn right. apart. And somewhere inside Fred with the journey he's had and, and the pain and the hurt and the feeling not valuable, mm -hmm. there's a connection to be a big brother right. yes. and a love there that holds him together to do what's in his heart. Right. And I think it's why we like Fred, because in his heart is what he really probably always wanted to be, right. which was someone connect, connected and valuable and a part of the family unit. Trailer Trash. This one came out, this one was successful at the time, maybe not as much as the filmmakers had hoped. I don't but think this one was overly financially a big runaway hit. I think it's later over time that, that it's really found its way into the culture more uh, so. I agree. So I wanted to ask you, have you sensed that this movie was 2007? So mm -hmm. it's, you know, you've had some time now. Are you hearing more and more from fans that this title comes up in kind of their favorites from you, you know, or starting to quote moments or bring it up to you? Or are you starting to feel the impact of this movie over time? One of the things that I think is interesting, you know, and, and so many times, if you're an actor, you're a participant in the way. And there's times where you're kind of not, and, you know, everyone's trying to make the decisions that they think are right for the movie. I remember David and I were coming off of Wedding Crashers, mm -hmm. which was such an R movie. Mm -hmm. And so in the marketing, they were like from the director of Wedding Crashers. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so it was an odd fit for the tone. What is it? Yep. Is the movie from the maker of Wedding Crashers, I, I, I haven't seen the old trailer in a, in a minute. It could be interesting to, to bring sure. it up yep. or to look at it. But then you're showing something that's that's kind of a holiday movie. Right, right. 100%. So in that, in that context, I think that just from a marketing point of view, mm -hmm. that there was a little bit of confusion over what is the tone or the rating of this. Was the week before Christmas and flying north in the sled was a very special visitor. Santa's big brother, Fred. Mr. Claus, welcome to the North Pole. Ah! Allergies. Gun! Ow, ow, ow. Take a service stand down. Ow, ow, ow. Oh, guys. What's that? Ow! That was nuts! You don't have ninjas jump me. They gotta make sure nothing happens to me. Something happened to them, maybe I give them something. No, 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 no! Warner Brothers Pictures invites you to come home for the holidays. Oh, thanks, Joe. My last eggnog was a little watery, and I'm just hoping this one's nice and thick like I enjoy so much. Okay, Fred. Mm, back on your A-game. The board is seriously considering shutting you down. What? Oh, and also, we're gonna dump the Easter Bunny. <gasps> Fred! All you think about is yourself. Don't throw snowballs at me, fat boy. Ah, come on. From the director of Wedding Crashers. Vince Vaughn. Am I having a ball? Oh, ho, ho, ho. Paul Giamatti. You need to practice tough love. I'm a saint, sweetheart. Tough love's a little difficult for me. Fred Claus. Yeah, you see, the, the whole DNA feels like it's a fun family kids movie. It's sort of broad humor. There's elves attacking this guy. It's fun. It's funny, but it mm -hmm. feels safe family. And then it's from the director of Wedding Crashers, but which even is some sort of, of the a physicality record style, they show feels kiddish. Right. It feels very kiddy. Yes, exactly. And so I feel like when you look at it, they're, it's kind of going in a lot of directions, and so it's hard to know. And watching that, you're totally right. What you're getting, even with your movie Christmas Story. Which I watched the original trailer to, by the way, unrecognizable to the movie. Right. They panicked. They made some dysfunctional, Let's watch crazy. That. I'm curious. In this modern age, perfect. Too many people have lost sight of the true meaning of Christmas. Mom, hush! Shut up, Ralphie. MGM presents a Christmas story. Come on. The movie that pulls off Santa's beard. Hey. 
and unwraps the secrets. Didn't I get a tie this year? Of the original, traditional. He looks like a deranged Easter bunny. 100% two fisted, red blooded. It's smiling at me. All American Christmas. Oh. A Christmas story. They're like saying that this is the 100%, 100% true American Christmas, but they're going to the oddest, broadest Completely. moments of the movie yeah. out of context in a row, which makes me feel like it's just silly and doesn't have any weight. And then when they say, pulls off the beard of Santa, like, what? I like Christmas. Who wants to pull off the beard of Santa? Right, right. So, so it's, it's odd. Like they didn't this, know how to sell it. They didn't know they how to sell it. They leaned into the lowest common denominator 100%. of let's go to the, the right. broadest, silliest stuff. But they, they would have loved to sell what they thought was going to work. By the way, no disrespect to the relatives or the marketers. I don't know <laughs> these people. I'm talking in a Happy vacuum, holidays. and I'm sure they were yeah. challenged with it. But they were going, let's just go to these strange, sped-up bullies, yeah. punching yeah. over and over. And it's like, What? Right. So I think the reason that your movie probably didn't do so well is if 100%. I saw that, I don't know what nope, it's about. Going. Right. The tone feels super silly. Yeah. Right. And I don't need to have the beard pulled off of Santa. There's and no I depth. don't know what a hundred percent real traditional red blooded two fist. <laughs> and, then, and then I'm seeing you guys sing fa ra 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 ra. You yeah, know, at a completely. at a restaurant, which I know. which wouldn't be like a traditional like a family around a turkey. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. what what is yeah. what is so. To that point, I think the Fred Claus marketing, they yes. went to a lot of the same, uh, the same most uh, I agree. kind of physically comedic totally. with a tone to let you know don't take it seriously right. bits that they could go to. And I think both trailers kind of made an audience feel like, what am I signing up for? What, what am right. I walking into? And a real telltale sign in Fred Claus, that scene with the give me one more, I like it smooth, you know, right. keep it coming. It's not in the movie. It's not even in the movie. And that's like an eight second joke. And it's not even the movie. Right. So they're pulling. But what is that saying? It's like we're saying, desperate to make sure. Here's a guy who sure. loves to drink alcohol. Right. From the director of Wedding Crashers. Right. Cut from the movie for a reason. But then we have Elvis punching trailer. you with, with uh, sound effects. So it's, it's like it's too many of a So mashup. they're very similar. But I think like Christmas Story was able to find an audience. Once you divorce yourself from the marketing materials, from whatever right. the, the box office performance was, and the movie begins to get introduced to you through friends, recommended, mm -hmm. you discover it now with a much more clear mind and think, oh, this is cool. And you have you don't carry the weight of that. Right. The movie begins to take on its own unique new life, I think. And that's what I experienced, and now I'm hearing about Fred Claus. Yeah, I think, you watch, audience, I think when you watch it in, on a, its in, in a vacuum is the combination of all the things that it was. If one thing David does is he made a really satisfying right. setup right. and that emotional ending is very strong mm -hmm. and there's a lot of fun 100%. along the way and some challenges and there is some tonal stuff that's, you know, always not always for all people right. in the same way that even Christmas Story has some some to Com tonal stuff. Completely. In it. It's kind of what makes me love Christmas Story the most is that it's so different. And yes. rhythm. When I first saw the movie, there was stuff I liked about it, but I was also like, it's, it's like hanging out weird. with a guy that's got a strange sense of humor. Mm -hmm. But it really grows on you, and you right. realize just how. You know, I love something like that that helps me catch up with that perspective and appreciate it. Yeah. Right. But it's not something that I know. And that's what's nice about revisiting some of these older movies is they yeah. have those elements or those complexities or those differences in story and tone within them that maybe you don't see getting made as much now. Funny is money. The first 20 minutes of this film, I am crying. I'm laughing. I'm like, what a fantastic comedy. And then you realize there, there, there's a bit of a pivot there, but it makes me miss those days of no one. There's this summer, I have, a, I have a Vince Vaughn comedy to look forward to. Yeah, I think audiences want those comedies. I think they'll start to make them again and you'll see it. You'll see so. it more. And I think you're I seeing so it now too. on the internet. Some of these guys that were not with the home or doing stand-up and doing comedy things and they're doing going big. Interviews, There's a lot of guys, doing, I think, yeah. that do Sketch, funny stuff that have yeah. a big audience. Oh, I yeah. agree. And now they're having to go to them. Yes, it's true. Now the now the the, the people that were, you know, in charge who <laughs> weren't allowing that type of stuff to get made, they don't have a choice. Right. They're having to go and say, we, can we do your special? Yes. Because the audience is so big. Audience is right. And audiences yeah. always know better than the committees or the executives That's or whatever right. thing is going on at the time that they're you know, evergreen, right? You know, whatever the phraseology of the uh, uh, right, uh, 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 verticals. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, whatever the whatever <laughs> the, the whatever right. the phraseology <laughs> yeah. of the day. 
you know, corporate speak. Yeah. Right. And then you got this whole other wave where like now you have these people who put themselves in the oddest position of being the curators of what was kind or unkind <laughs> or what was conscious or what conscious. Right, right. Or this was okay, but this wasn't. Or I cringe when I look back at this. It's right. like crazy. You know, it's like Shakespeare says, time out of joint as things go on. But I think those are sometimes the cringiest. Mm-hmm. To, to, to be to the dictate, person to, to get up there. To be that one doing that. The purveyor yeah, exactly. of. Of yeah. what is funny or what isn't. Like, comedy's a big tent. Right. It's ever-evolving. <laughs> it's not to be dictated. Right. Or not just that, but for someone to take a pipe and say, well, it's comedy with a heart. There, there's lots of great comedies that have no heart. Yeah. Right. They're yeah. just funny. Right. They're just funny. And they're just farces and they're fun. And then there, there are some comedies that also have a heart. Like, mm-hmm. there's no one way one, to the waterfall. Right. It's a right. crazy idea. Mm-hmm. Does it does happen and say, here's how you do comedy? It's like, you know, you got slipping on a banana peel to, yeah, right. you know, totally odd true. conversations to, right. you know, there's a there's a wide range of what people find to be to, yeah. to be funny. And so I think that there became that other strange thing where, like, it's like almost like people that would like, you know, sit and overanalyze a situation mm-hmm. to the point of making themselves feel... Sure. You know, really good about themselves. Yeah. Instead of taking that energy potentially. And I, my, gu- my, my yeah. guess would be they'd have something that they're not thrilled about. <laughs> I haven't met someone who's not. You are know you, what I mean? But my guess think? is they might have yeah. one area. There might be one area of their life where they didn't handle everything perfectly. perfectly. Right? They're just, I, I've yet to meet anyone over the age of maybe six months. <laughs> Who, ha- who, who doesn't have an area in the moment where maybe they're not like absolutely a thousand. handling it in the most elegant, positive, right, <laughs> empathetic way possible. So maybe, maybe take your fucking spirit and start, like Michael said, with the man in the mirror. Right. And if you want to make that change, right? <laughs> If you want to make that change, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe start with yourself. Jam on. <laughs> I'm perfect. All my communications with Absolutely. all my friends yeah. and all my loved ones, <laughs> the way I interact in traffic. Yep. All of it. Right? The thoughts that go through my head. Perfect. Right? At all times are always just so worldly and kind and perfect. Right. Always. <laughs> And I'm going to advertise it all day and shove right. it down everyone's throat. <laughs> Let me take time out of my perfect, kind <laughs> jaunt through life to suggest that looking at this, this is truly ugly. And now yes. I'm going to explain why. <laughs> and Thank it's just, for- but, the, but the lack of awareness. Yeah. Right. Where like, as you talk, as it, as it goes back to even Fred or something is, you know, people aren't perfect. Right. And life is not easy. Yeah. And it's all relative. And so part of the journey of life is trying to make sense of 100%. feelings and experiences yeah. and, and points of view. And part of that's messy. It is. And that's why it, it, it's also very relatable, I think. You know, especially when you watch this movie, you see shades of yourself in a lot of them. Yes. Like the good ones you do. Well, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yes. Yeah. Thank this you so is much really for, fun to talk for about. coming down today. Yeah, yeah. Great to be with you. Honestly. Uh, great to be with awesome. you. Awesome. Really, really fun to revisit the movie and to hear your insight and David's insight into this. It's just uh, really holds up well. And I think it's going to just continue to find an audience. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Nice to see you, gentlemen. You both nice look you. well put together, groomed today. <laughs> the smells are, the smells are acceptable. Really it makes it, makes it an I'm enjoyable encounter. That. Thank you. If you're running a small business, especially around the holidays, you know things can get very stressful. New customers and new heights means new problems every single day. And as your business grows and your company expands, the simple tasks you used to do in a day are now taking weeks to complete. Well, if this is you, you should know these three numbers. 36,000, 25, 1. 36,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25. NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less. Close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all your key performance indicators in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need, 
all in one place with NetSuite. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free at netsuite.com slash Christmas. That's netsuite.com slash Christmas to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash Christmas. Freddy or not. After Fred has gotten this advice from Siblings Anonymous and from Bill Clinton's brother, (laughs) he returns back to the North Pole, only to find that Santa Claus is in fact bedridden and Christmas is in effect shut down. Knowing that only a clause can deliver presents from the sleigh on Christmas Eve, Santa's out. That means only Fred can do it. (laughs) He's the only one in the world. He's fallen short in everything else. He decides to accept the challenge. Let's see if Fred can pull off Saving Christmas and how this movie ends its conflict. Okay, we've got 10 hours, Fred. We need to be done delivering by 5.38 a.m. North Pole time. That's sunrise and that's game over. I have a bad feeling about this. We did it. There you go. Fred fulfills the promise he stated at the very beginning of the film. To be the best big brother ever, and Fred has successfully delivered Christmas Mm -hmm. to all children across the world (laughs) against all odds. Yes. This movie really has an emotional punch in the the end here. Right. And to see the reconciliation of these guys done in that way just really, really hits you hard. Yeah, you're seeing the globe. You're seeing families all across the world celebrating Christmas and in a joyous mood, obviously— and none more so than their own. But it gives you a lot of the sense of that Christmas spirit. Yes. And those, those wonderful emotional feelings up in the North Pole. Together again. So with Christmas saved, the brothers happily reunited. Let's see how this movie resolves itself. Freddie, is it all right that we're doing this? It's a company car. It's one of the perks. Oh, Freddy, it's unbelievable. We're in Paris, baby. We're in Paris. <laughs> I just love Wanda. I mean, she's a little bit above your station, and so I thought maybe you should just sort of clean up your act, you know? Have a great new wardrobe to start off the new year. You're a clause. Get out there. You know, look at your dad. He's always so dapper. Don't do it to me, Mom. You know what I mean? I'm trying to be positive. Oh, but I'm positive, too. I'm positive. I'm right. You need a new wardrobe. Okay. Happy New Year to you, Happy New Year. I love you. I love you, too. Everything is still not perfect, but family's not perfect, right? Uh, That's right. It, but, you know, you hear... Mama Claus, tell Fred, uh, I love you too. And that's the first time you hear that in the film. That's Mm -hmm. very sweet. And obviously, you know, the resolve with Nicholas is set in place and uh, everybody seems to be happy. You know, it's funny because Wanda wanted to go to France, right? Mm -hmm. At the beginning of the movie and he missed it. And they were probably going to 
you know, fly coach on a budget or whatever. Right. So she gets what she wanted in a way even better than she could have expected. She gets sure. to ride on Santa's sleigh around the <laughs> Eiffel Tower in the middle of the night being pulled by reindeer. So there's just a lot of wish fulfillment and kind of fantasy in it as well. And it's a nice love story that yeah. Fred's able to rectify. And Fred uh, got his OTB. Yeah. And, and he's he also sponsoring some little wrap ups. <laughs> yeah. He's sponsoring Slam's baseball team right. with an off track betting and Slam got a family. Yes. This one makes you feel really good and it's just a uh, Put you in a good mood. Yeah, it seems um, maybe misunderstood via marketing, but boy, does this film really deliver and um, has shown resonance over the years. So where this film stacks up, it opened November of 2007 and did $98 million worldwide at the box office, which I think sounds on, on, the, on the high side, sure. but still I don't think was quite at the expectation of the filmmakers. Given their budget... Yeah, given the budget being close to $100 million, right. and as time has gone on, it's it's one of those titles that's starting to move up lists, starting mm -hmm. to grow. And if you check iTunes and, you know, all those things for popular movies around Christmas, this one's sure. popping on the list with a lot of other familiar movies. So it's nice to see you can see why. It's a movie that ages well. Yes, and uh, look, we're very grateful to have David Dobkin and Vince Vaughn come in today, and I think even in talking to them, you know, towards the end of our conversation and even seeing them off, they each seem very, very proud of what they accomplished with this film. Well, there you have it. Enjoyed this one, as always. Thank you, Peter. Thanks Thank for, for uh, doing this, Steve. This it was is... a total blast. Yeah, this, <laughs> this was a great one. <laughs> insightful. This was obviously very funny. Yeah. It is Fred Claus. So uh, Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night. <laughs>